probably the most lasting legacy of an academic teacher, of a person in academia, that you kind of try to help uh, the next generation to evolve uh, and to, to find their, to make their careers in science. And in this regard, I have been blessed over the many years in, in Mülheim. And you can quote me, I have been particularly blessed with my Spanish community. And uh, I have many, many excellent uh, students from Spain, postdocs from Spain. I cannot name all of them, but certainly I cannot help but uh, mention in historic order after Ruben Martin came Cristina Nevado, and after Cristina Nevado came Manuel Alcarazzo, and after Manuel came Alicia Casitas, who I hope is also on her way to an <coughs> international career. And then on top of those, uh, there's Beb Cornella. Beb Cornella has never been my co-worker, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> if he would have been my co-worker, I would be as famous as Phil Barron. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, still, Bip uh, uses my Nama machine as our chemicals, and so I still count him somehow to the orbit uh, which I have been able to create in, in my, during my years in Mülheim. But that brings me immediately back to Professor Falwenga. Because just as uh, Ruben Martin and uh, Cristina Nevado and Manuel and, and Bep they came to Mülheim, and I think these years in Mülheim have been somehow important to their careers, and then they went on to establish their own careers and, and uh, create their own, uh, own science. Uh, very similar to what Professor Paloenga did, because some of you might know that Professor Paloenga spent uh, about three years uh, in his early career, what we would call a postdoc, at the MPI in Mülheim, where I come from. And I had the opportunity to talk to him a couple of times, and he clearly conveyed to me that these three years in Mülheim have been critically important for him, uh, because they kind of shaped his idea of how to do science, and uh, also shaped his vision of what he wanted to accomplish and wanted to do. And so in this regard, I think I have had the advantage when, when, when I first got to know him because I was the new kind of director there and so I was very well received by Professor Paluenga also uh, in a very friendly and a very open manner and uh, that also gave me the opportunity to learn about his personality. He was a very strong, energetic, uh, opinionated <coughs> person, no doubt about this, uh, but at the same time he was a person who had a gateway interest in science. And uh, also a very charismatic person. And from, from getting to know his personality, one could also uh, understand why he had such a lasting impact on the science landscape here in this country. And I think, therefore, it's uh, an honor to pay tribute to his memory uh, and uh, to, uh, to, to commemorate him. And I had the opportunity a couple of years later to welcome him uh, in Mülheim for a special lectureship and this is a photograph that I took at that time in my office, it reads I think May 13th of 2005 and he was very happy to come back and it was a very memorable day uh, to those who had the opportunity to be there. I was thinking of <coughs> yeah, my career is now already so quite long so how do you summarize your, career, your own career in one or two slides and this is not so easy to do. And so I, 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 I came up with the idea, maybe you know this, this uh, dinner party game where you have to go, to go to a dinner party and you have to describe yourself <coughs> as an animal or I don't know, and then, then the young boys who want to impress the girls say, oh, uh, I'm the tiger or, or you know, I'm, I, I'm the teddy bear or, uh, or I'm the squirrel, I don't know what. So I was thinking of, can I think of a single item that would describe my scientific career reasonably concisely. And it didn't take me too long to come up with, with one item that does describe my scientific career quite well. And I came up with this one. It is a Roman coin from about 220 before Christ, so the time of the Punic War, the war between Rome and Carthago. And it shows uh, the face of the Roman god Janus. And I thought that befits me very well. It's very old, so that fits me well. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's old fashioned and also fits me well. You will see my approach to science is very old fashioned. But it, I like it most because the, the Janus has two faces which are in, intimately tied together. 
cannot be really separated from one each from one each other, one from each other. And that describes my scientific career well. Because <coughs> what we have done, one of our faces has always been always been looking towards methodology, especially catalytic methodology and the organometallic chemistry that came with it, and uh, Ruben has uh, summarized and mentioned most of this. We have a long-lasting, ongoing love affair with metathesis of all kinds. We have done some biacid catalysis. We have, uh, we are working on transhydrogenation, hydrometallation chemistry, some more traditional rhodium carbene chemistry, and also a project on iron catalysis. And uh, this will be the major topic of my presentation today as we move on. But I have also always been looking in a different direction, and the other direction has always been um, target-oriented synthesis. And over the years, we have made something like, I don't know, 75 or 80 compounds of reasonable complexity. Uh, and of course, uh, I like it because these two phases cannot be separated. The same is true for these two research areas. So the choice or, or the, 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 the methodologies we have been interested in over the years have clearly impacted on our choice of target molecules, there is absolutely no doubt. But it's also true that the target molecules that we have been interested in have also impacted on the methodology that we have been trying to develop. And maybe this presentation today gives you a slight idea of this mutual cross-fertilization of the two research areas. Now, the project that I want to describe to you today uh, started actually when we were facing a problem in natural product photosynthesis. And the problem that we were facing then is illustrated over here. About now, now more than 10 years ago, we had a quite long lasting project on target molecules of this type, and that was in a collaboration then with Pfizer Oncology. And Pfizer Oncology, the oncologist said Pfizer, had a very strong interest in compounds of this type, which were supposed to be published to be highly potent cell migration <coughs> inhibitors. And if you could if prevent cells from migrating, you could potentially interfere with metastasis. And if you could interfere with metastasis, you would have a second line of defense against cancer. So that was basically the interest that why uh, Big Pharma had this strong interest. And these compounds were supposed to be very potent along these lines. And these activities were claimed in some <coughs> high profile, more magazine type journals, which most people like so much. Um, just to cut a long story short, these claims in these high profile journals turned out to be completely irreproducible in the Pfizer oncology laboratories. So the biology in the end was not very cooperative. Mm -hmm. But first you have to make the compounds to find out that what has been out there and has been claimed in Nature and in other science journals uh, is probably completely wrong. Uh, so first we have to make them. And the approach that we have been choosing is illustrated over here. It was an exercise at that time in the reclosing alkyne metathesis with the aid of a catalyst that we have been developing at the same time in my laboratory and which worked very well that allowed us to close this uh, quite strained uh, ring compound and then we were facing the problem, actually, of how we would convert the alkyne into the E-alkene of the target molecule. And now you may say, okay, that is easy, because that's what we teach and learn to the undergraduate community. Uh, converting a triple bond into an E-alkene is a Birch reduction. Let me just remind you, a Birch reduction means you dissolve your compound in liquid ammonia, and then you throw in potassium or sodium or something of that kind. So that's exactly what you do not want to do to a molecule of this, uh, of this kind. And so <laughs> let me ask the question differently. Which <coughs> alternative to the Birch reduction do you know, which might promise to be compatible with a molecule of this type of complexity? And the only alternative that I knew at that time when we made this was a method that had originally been described by Professor Barry Trost, and uh, just three or four months later by my own group, uh, where we found in my group by serendipity that uh, a hydrocylylation reaction, so if we take a silane and you catalyze the hydrocylylation with the aid of this CP star cationic <coughs> catalyst, then the hydrocylylation goes trans. 
silicon and hydrogen end are trans to each other to the triple bond to give you this kind of compound, which worked very nicely in this particular case. And that basically solved the synthetic problem, because all you need to do is treat that as fluoride that flips this one off. Fluoride deprotects. Fluoride is basic enough to eliminate the aldol. That gives you this very strained head group. And then you have the deprotected OH, which you oxidize to the ketone, and then you have mukayama aldol reaction away from the top. So that allowed us to make the, the compounds just to find out that they are not as promising as uh, we had hoped at the very beginning. Now, in hindsight, I must say, probably this was good luck. If these compounds had been very potent in terms of biology, we would probably have spent a lot of time of making analogs and uh, derivatives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as the biology was not cooperative, so actually we had time to think about the chemistry, and we started to think about this funny transhydrosilylation reaction. Because you may say, okay, hold on, what you tell us here that should not be the case, that should not happen. Let me just remind you what all of you have learned some, at some point in the basic organometallic chemistry uh, courses. If you take a silane or a borane or a stanane or a dihydrogen and you take any transition metal catalyst you want, as soon as this transition metal catalyst inserts into these bonds, then an empty orbital at your catalyst starts talking to the filled orbital of your triple bond. And at the same time, the filled metal hydrogen orbital starts donating into the antibonding orbitals of your bi system. This is a kind of a synergistic dual Chuck Duncanson bonding situation, so very favorable, which necessarily evolves into a four member transition state, which necessarily means that you deliver both elements from the same phase. So, hydrogenation, hydrosilylation, hydrosilylation, etc., is necessarily and invariably a syn suprafacial cis addition reaction with essentially no exception. You can maybe isomerize your product later, but the stereochemistry of the elementary step itself is a sin delivery. And there is no serious exception to it as long as there is no radical on your pathway. And just believe me, on our reaction, to the best of our knowledge, there is no radical. And the same is true for the uncatalyzed reaction. And the most famous example is the classical hydroboration. In the hydroboration, it's the empty orbital on boron, the B orbital on boron, which talks to the filled orbital of your substrate. And the boron hydrogen bond starts donating into the antibonding, which again evolves into a four member transition state, a classical transition state that all the textbooks on organic chemistry feature on hydroboration reaction, which again means that hydroboration in stereochemistry is cis and suprafacial, and there is no serious exception <coughs> to the rule. Now, I have shown you that in our case, hydrosilylation went trans, so it shouldn't. So that might mean that maybe we are looking at a kind of a mechanism which might differ from the canonical mechanism that I have just alluded to, that we all teach and learn. The other question, equally important question is, is this a singularity? Is this limited to hydrosilylation? Because in a baryonic table, below silicon you have germanium and tin, can we do a trans hydrostanation? Above silicon is carbon. Can we add a hydrocarbon trans across a triple bond? Now, that would be a kind of a nice uh, type of transformation. Left to carbon is boron. Can we do a trans hydroboration? <coughs> Left to boron is hydrogen. Can we do a trans hydrogenation reaction? None of these transformations exists in the literature. But the answer is yes, you can. And it didn't take very long. All it takes, oh, it took long, but that's just because I'm stupid that it took so long. Uh, but that's another story. <laughs> but all you need to do is take the same catalyst and replace your silane with pinacol borane, and hydroboration goes trans. And first, of course, spectroscopy is very clear and unambiguous. And yet I, I was thinking, OK, we must be very careful. Uh, don't make a mistake at this level. And so we crystallized a couple of examples. And here's this particular one. And here you see from the X-ray structure, the hydrogen atom and the boron atom are trans to each other. There's absolutely no doubt that it is a trans hydroboration. And we get appreciable levels of selectivity, as you can see. And so I always say that I wish Professor H.C. Brown had lived long enough to see that you can break this law of the, the sin delivery in hydroboration chemistry. 
that's not only limited to hydroboration, and you won't be surprised if hydrocyclation goes trans and hydroboration goes trans. You won't be surprised that hydrotermination goes trans and hydrostanulation also goes trans. All of them go trans with essentially the same catalyst system. Now, this slide also shows you one of the problems that you face with this chemistry and uh, with any hydroelementation reaction. As soon as your substrate is unsymmetrical, you can add your silane or your stanane or your borane in two different ways. So the problem is the ratio chemistry, and that's what you see over here. Indeed, if you do the hydrocylation with the same catalyst, you get two regio isomers. But look at the isomers, each of them is trans. So the stereochemistry is perfect. It's the regio chemistry <coughs> which gives us a problem here, round about three to one. And I had no real idea of how we might fix this problem. But uh, my student said, OK, we close the eyes and we screen all the catalysts that we can find in the laboratory. <coughs> and it didn't take him very long to find out that if you replace the cationic catalyst by a neutral catalyst, just Cp star rosinium chloride, which is the precursor to the cationic one, which is a tetramer in the solid state, but disassembles to the monomer as soon as you dissolve it in, in the solvent. If you take the neutral one, you make only a single Riccio isomer in virtually perfect with virtually perfect selectivity. So we have two catalyst systems. They do the same chemistry transition. They differ a little bit in reactivity. One is cationic, one is neutral. And they differ essentially in the regiochemical outcome that we do observe. Now, what, why does the chloride make all the difference? We could get some insight into this because we managed to co-crystallize the stannane reagent with our ruthenium chloride catalyst. And as you can see over here, it's the tin hydrogen bond that binds to the metal. <coughs> And that's interesting because it, the metal has not inserted into the bond. And remember what I just showed you in the canonical mechanism. In the canonical mechanism, the transition metal inserts. Here the metal has not inserted. It's the sigma bond which is the ligand to the metal. And at the same time, the chloride talks to the tin. The tin is on the way of becoming pentavalent. And that might also be important, as you will see in a second. We also managed to co-crystallize the substrates, or actually several substrates of this type, with metal. And here again you see the metal binds the triple bond. The triple bond is supposed to be linear, and just by looking at the X-ray structure you see it's very strongly bent. So from the X-ray structure you immediately know that there is a lot of electron back donation from the metal D orbitals into the antibonding orbitals of your pi system. So it's a massive rehybridization, it's ongoing. And that's also manifested in the carbon shifts. The triple bond has a carbon shift of, I don't know, 85, 90 ppm. Here, the carbon shifts of the former triple bond is at 156 and 136. So it's a massive electronic change uh, that we do upon coordination. So the metal activates the bond. But the chloride, again, comes into play. The chloride talks to the propachylic substituent, to the OH group in this case, it engages the OH group into a pretty strong hydrogen bond. So what we are observing here in these X-ray structures is that the metal activates the bond, but the ligand to the metal locks the substrate in place through hydrogen bonding and steers the incoming reagent through talking to the thin uh, element. And so you can write that down in a Newman-type projection in this way. This is the metal that activates the bonds, the chloride fixes, the substrate and steers the incoming reagent such that hydride delivery will be to the distal end of your triple bond and then silicon or germanium or tin or whatever you have will end up proximal and that's the pattern that we observe. It's the alpha trans product that you generate with very high levels of selectivity. That can be potentially be useful. Let me just give you a small application, an early <coughs> application from my laboratory that was one of the early target molecules. So if you look at this kind of pattern, it's obvious what we want to do. It's an exercise in reclosing alkyne metathesis with our molybdenum catalyst, which works very nicely. <laughs> then we do protect in order to harness the steering effect of the hydroxy group. Hydrostanation goes alpha trans. It's just a pattern that you have seen. And then you are cross-coupling the reaction away from the target molecule that you make. So that is relatively straightforward. Uh, and those of you who know 
all of the metathesis, chemistry, know that tri substituted all the things with Crux catalysis sometimes work very well, sometimes fail completely, and there's a whole continuum in between. Here we use triple bond metathesis to approach tri substituted all of this in a stereo defined manner, and I think we start to be competitive. But of course, once you have such an intermediate, you don't have to stitch in a methyl group. You can do whatever you want. For instance, you can take the tinctures off and you make the normethyl derivative of your natural product, or you can carbonylate with palladium, or you can convert into halide, you can turn it into fluoride, you can oxidize the carbon silicon or carbon tin bond uh, and make the carbonyl. So you can make from this intermediate a uh, whole small collection, I don't call it a library, I'm not a librarian, it's a small collection of <laughs> analogs of your natural product of the antibiotic which you can use for biological testing. But this is a relatively simple application, so I don't want to let you get away with uh, such simple kind of natural product synthesis. Let, I want to show you at least one, a bit more sophisticated one, and that's one of my favorites. It's one of these molecules which have been isolated from a marine source. The structure has been published and nobody ever looked at it again. And uh, it has n the isolation team has not reported any particular biological activity, so probably a completely meaningless molecule. <laughs> uh, but try to build a triding model of this one. And I like triding models. Try to build a triding model of this, and you will have a very hard time to close it. It's so strange that you have a hard time to close your model. So strain is dominating this molecule. And that's also manifested in this notion. This is obviously a beta keto ester. And this ketone is completely enolized, totally enolized, and it's enolized to the bridge head. That's not what you would expect from an ordinary organic molecule. So there's something funny going on here in the background. And we said, okay, that is maybe interesting what we can do over here. And the idea we came up with is, as I said, this is a beta keto ester, so if you look at it long enough, you could potentially disconnect the molecule and try to make the strain, this highly strained five, nine, six member cyclic system through a transannular approach, that you make a macro cycle which you then contract to the nine member, to this super strained nine member drink system by a micro addition onto such a micro acceptor, and all you need is to get this configuration right in order to set this stereo center with the right absolute configuration. That's what we need. And if that is true, then again, we could probably use this the possibility to functionalize the alpha position of a hydroxy group uh, that I have just alluded to. There are some electronic arguments why we thought that this is a very good micro acceptor, but I skip over it for the sake of time. Anyway, so what we did is, so this is the target molecule, so we made this precursor using essentially only <coughs> catalytic methods, and we subjected the ring-closing alkyne metathesis, again using our own catalyst, which works well. We harness the steering effect to the trans-alpha, trans-hydrostanation reaction to get this compound, which we subject to palladium-catalyzed methoxycarbonylation, so you replace the tin by palladium, you uh, insert carbon monoxide into the alkenyl palladium, make an acyl palladium which you quench with methanol that gives you the methyl ester with the correct configuration that we need as a micro acceptor for the ring contraction reaction. And all of this actually worked well with the diol, and then we tried to do the ring contraction, this micro addition reaction, just to find out that if you do try to do that, then this hydroxy group bites back into the lactone on the other side. So you do a trans and you open your system and you lose everything that you have done. So we could not get away with the diol unprotected. So we had to protect the diol and we chose the cyclic carbonate. And what we do now is actually simple. All it takes is sabonify the acetate off, generate your cesium um, micro donor. The micro donor micro adds transannularly into the micro acceptor. If you do a micro addition, you generate an enolate, so you generate negative charge at this site, which finds a leaving group next to it, extrudes the leaving group. If it extrudes the leaving group, the cyclic carbonate springs open, releases a hydroxy group, which then bites into the methyl ester on the other side, generates a butenolite, and this butenolite is so strained and unhappy 
that it will do everything to escape from this position. And what it does is accepts methanol from the medium as an oxamycal donor. And so even though we destroy one chiral center in the sequence, which regenerate the, the, the chiral center with the same stereochemistry, because methanol attack can only come from the front side, because the back side is shielded through the nine membrane. Yeah. So that gives this cascade gives us this compound in 90, 80 something percent yield, and then you adjust a deep protection away. So maybe from this structure, it's not so obvious where we want to do or where, where we want to apply the chemistry that we are trying to develop. But let's move on. I talked, so here's just a short summary of some of the natural products that we have been able to make <coughs> using this trans addition hydroelementation chemistry, starting with relatively simple ones. And we, as we learned that this is reliable and works in the presence of all kinds of functional groups, we are increasingly uh, uh, courageous and try to apply it in a more difficult context. But let's move on. I talked about hydrocarbons. Can we extend the transition chemistry to hydrocarbons? That would be really nice. And the answer is yes and no. <laughs> yes, because it works with this type of terminal alkynes carrying a bulky substituent on the other end of the triple bond. But that is as good as it gets. We haven't found any other system that works reasonably well. But with this kind of system, it works quite nicely. And so what we get is a trans hydroalkynylation reaction using essentially the same catalyst system, a reaction that was not existent in the literature before. And during this study, my student also found that we can extend it to chloroalkynes and get a trans chloroalkynylation reaction, again a transformation which was not existent in the literature before, and then of course you can use these compounds here applied to an unsymmetrical one, we get this reach isomer, take it off, cyclize it and make functionalized heterocycles and blah blah blah. So this is okay. <coughs> Since all of this works, you won't be surprised that hydrogenation also works, again using essentially the same catalyst system. And here I show you deliberately our initial results where we had still used cationic complexes, later we found that neutral ones sometimes are even an advantage. But I deliberately show you the, the cationic first, and again you will <coughs> see we get appreciable amounts of trans hydrogenation reaction. And to the best of our knowledge, it's a real trans hydrogenation. It's not that we make cis and isomerize, but it's a trans delivery. And there is room in terms of functional group compatibility, an ester, a reducible NO bond, a reducible bromide, an acetal, uh, a ketone, a double bond, a nitro group, an aldehyde, a nitrile, divalent sulfur, all of this is compatible. So there is some room for applications probably to more advanced cases. And I just show you a very simple one first. These uh, single lipids are very potent. This particular one have been, this particular one has been in a preclinical trial. It comes from a marine source, and this preclinical pre trial had to be stopped simply because there was no material around to, for clinical testing. And so many people tried to make this compound on scale, and uh, the obvious precursor to the acid part encoded in red is an alkyne of this sort, because this is glyoxal and a commercial alkyne. So all you need to do is add it together and do an enzymatic resolution. So this compound can be made on a multi gram scale if you need, need to do so very, very readily. And then the problem is how you convert that into the, the E alkene. And the classical literature approach is reduce the propartial alcohol with lithium aluminum hydride, which works well, <laughs> but is chemo unselective and also reduces the ester down to the alcohol. And then you start chuckling. Mono protection, orthogonal dye protection, Mono deprotection, oxidation deprotection, and that's not because these people were bad chemists, because there's essentially no alternative to it. And all of this chemistry now boils down essentially to a single hydrogenation reaction, uh, and we did it on a grand scale, but it's hydrogenation. I think you can do that on any scale if you would need really a large material supply. There is no inherent limitation. And yet, I must be honest with you, to tell you that of all the reactions that I've shown you, transhydrogenation is the most problematic one. It's the most problematic one because it has one important limitation, which I do not want to hide. And this important limitation actually surfaced 
when we did another application. And the application was Prefeldin. Those of you who know natural products, this is a fossil that has been made, I don't know, 50 times or so. Maybe the largest reported amounts have been three milligrams or five milligrams. So the target was again, let's make a gram. It's a very potent compound that destroys the Golgi selectively, so it's important for chemical biology. And again, the approach is simple. We make the substrate, do ring closing alkyl metathesis, <laughs> follow up with transhydrogenation. And in terms of stereochemistry, the transhydrogenation is perfect. You <coughs> practically do not see the other isomer. So stereochemistry is wonderful. What's not good here is the yield. 56% for hydrogenation is more on the low, low end of the spectrum. And the yield is low because during this hydrogenation, we also form about 12 to 15% combined yield of these olefin isomers, where the, the disubstituted olefin has migrated into trisubstituted position. And of course, you can imagine it's very difficult to separate those isomers from that one that's essentially HPLC. And that's, of course, where you lose, lose a lot of your material. So that's not so nice. Oh, well, when we got this result, I was not so surprised. Because those of you who know organometallic chemistry know that isomerization of olefins is a facile process. There are several <coughs> mechanisms by which that could happen. And so I said to myself, maybe if we haven't found another isomerization catalyst, right? It goes to the more substituted end, and so to the thermodynamic position, so it's not so surprising. But my student made an important control experiment. My student isolated this compound in pure form and resubjected it to the reaction conditions, just to find out that there is no isomerization. Okay, so it seemed as if these isomers that we generate originate from the transhydrogenation process <coughs> themselves. And that gave us a lot of headache. Because, first of all, how does the transhydrogenation work? Because I have not talked about the mechanism yet. And secondly, how do we produce an olefin isomer by that mechanism? And to be frank with you, when we did this chemistry, when we discovered these transformations, I was incapable of writing down a mechanism that would convince myself, not to speak of my peers, <laughs> who review our papers. And if you have no idea what are you going to do, there is no precedent in the literature, so what are you going to do? And I said at the beginning, I'm an old-fashioned person. So, so we chose an old-fashioned approach. So we thought, OK, we take, we take the fishing rod, Critical fish. Let's see which fish <coughs> swim in such a soup. Knowing very well that if you can fish out something from a catalytic crew, that does not mean that what you can fish out is relevant. <laughs> okay? Especially in hydrogenation chemistry. Let me remind you of the mechanism of Wilkinson's catalyst. Check how it worked. I don't know, 10 years of his life. And everything they could isolate from this mixture was turned out to be completely irrelevant for the mechanism of how Wilkinson's catalyst operates. But if you have no starting point, okay, so we chose this very conservative approach. And here it is. So we were looking up which <coughs> hydrogen compounds might be the catalyst. So this is an obvious candidate. But this is well known in the literature. Just believe me, this is not the catalyst. Okay, very lousy. But our original system, and that's why I showed you our original system first, our original system was cationic. So I said to myself, maybe we have to ionize it somehow, in situ or ex situ. And that can be done in two different ways. So either you ionize the free catalyst and put it under hydrogen, or you take this one and you protonate it, that also gives you the very same complex. And this complex that you generate had been isolated and very carefully characterized by a group in Hong Kong many years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. And the group in Hong Kong showed that the, the hydrogen complex that you generate is actually not a dihydride, but again a sigma complex. It's again the sigma bond of dihydrogen, which is the liquid. So very similar to what I've shown you on, this, on the standing before. Uh, and if you make this complex and take it as a catalyst, you get e. So this was a kind of a first hint 
that maybe something like this might be somewhere connected to our catalytic manifold. Okay. But the other thing, which was more interesting and more difficult to answer, is actually something else. If you write down your your scheme, as I do here, it's very auto-suggestive. It suggests to yourself that the two hydrogen atoms in your product come from the same H2. Do we know that this is the case? And actually, one of the, the, the theories that I had, one of the mechanistic hypotheses, was maybe we have one metal that delivers from one side and another metal delivering from the other side, some cluster or whatever it might be. And so do we really know that they come from the same H2? And the first thing that we tried was replacing H2 by HD, deuterium, and that never worked because it scrambles and you lose all your information. And then some <laughs> it came back to me what I had learned as a student at some point that I had referred to the mechanism of the Wilkinson catalyst before. And people, Richard Eisberg and others, had studied it by a wonderful technique, an MR technique, which might also give us an answer here. This NMR technique is called para-hydrogen-induced polarization transfer. Now, this is the slide I'm most afraid of. Because there might be people here in the audience who are experts in NMR spectroscopy or who are physical organic chemists. And so if you are a physical organic chemist or an NMR expert, Close your eyes for the next minute or so, please, neighbor, because I'm going to explain the effect in super simplistic and therefore incorrect terms. Okay. So we all know that electrons spin spare. If electrons spin spare like this, you make a chemical bond. Nuclear spins also bear like this. Dihydrogen, they can bear like this. This is para hydrogen. This is the thermodynamically more stable form of dihydrogen. But they can also bear like this. This is also hydrogen. And the energy difference between the two isomers is very small. So if you do a hydrogenation in your laboratory, basically all the hydrogen is also. But if you cool your sample to liquid nitrogen temperature, you enrich in para up to, I don't know, 94% or something like this. And if you take your para hydrogen and you do your hydrogenation, you transfer the spin labels to your product. And if the two protons in your product are magnetically coupled, then their signal gets enhanced by up to a factor of 10,000 if they originate from the same H2. That's the quantum physics behind this. Okay. So that experiment tells us if they come from one or from two. So let's take an unsymmetrical substrate. Let's hydrogenate it with para hydrogen. If the olefinic signals slide up, we know they come from the same H2. And here's the NMR. The olefins light up. So clearly, they come from one <coughs> single H2 molecule, which is mechanistically important. But what was actually more interesting and certainly much more surprising is that we also get FIP enhanced signals in the aliphatic particulation of the spectrum. This is not a cyclohexyl. The cyclohexyl is in the baseline. So everything you see here is FIP enhanced. And if you look here, you see aliphatic signals, which has J coupling of around about 17 hertz. And if you zoom in, you will see it's kind of like of an AB pattern. So which aliphatic signal gives an AB pattern and a J coupling of 17 hertz? There are not many candidates, okay? And the most <laughs> and the most likely candidate is a methylene, a diastereotopic methylene group. So do we generate methylene groups by hydrogenating a triple bond? Then the question is, what is on the other carbon of your triple bond? Okay. Well, maybe the catalyst. Okay. So maybe we look at something like this. Okay. But of course, this is absolutely no proof. This is pure speculation. But NMR has another good advantage. It tells you that this signal comes from a stable product. The spin label stays there for days. This is some sort of an intermediate because the half-life is 
something like an hour in this particular case. So it fades away fairly quickly. Now, let's assume it's a car. Let's assume for a second it's a carbene. We all know carbenes are very reactive intermediates. What we want is we need to stabilize it to the extent that we can check is it a carbene or is it something else. And they, we came up with the idea, you don't need to be a super genius. Let's try to bulk it up to protect it sterically. Let's put in extra donor atoms maybe to stabilize it electronically. <coughs> and so we came up with the idea to use substrates of this type. We do the same hydrogenation, we get the same pattern, <coughs> 17 hertz. And now the half-life is about, I don't know, 15 or 16 hours or something on that, on that order of magnitude. So much more stable. Stable enough that you can do ordinary spectroscopy on it. And if you do an ordinary carbon spectrum, you get a signal at 340 ppm. Strongly indicative that we generate a carbon. So I said to my student, what are you doing during nighttime? <laughs> <laughs> it has a half-life of 15 hours, so it's long enough that you make it and then you grow, get it out of the solution, then you grow a few nice single crystal, one is enough. And then next morning you put it on the X-ray diffractometer machine, so it's very simple. <laughs> <laughs> and after a couple of failed attempts, he was actually able to do that, and he was able to grow crystals in X-ray tells you it's a carbon. There is absolutely no doubt. And I like it because <coughs> even though our substrate is almost symmetrical, within the limits of detection, we generate a single carbene where the carbene resides next to the alcohol, next to the alcohol, because the alcohol again engages in a strong hydrogen bond with the chloride, just as I had shown you before in the previous <laughs> exercise. And the ether does an ordinary Lewis acid, Lewis base, donor acceptor type of interaction and stabilizes it. So if we get lucky, we can use these propargylic substituents to steer carbene formation to one or the other end of your triple bond. But if you go back and look at it at the meta level, I think what we are doing is this. We, for the first time ever, we deliver both hydrogen atoms to one and the same carbon atom of a bi-system and at the same time generate discrete metal carbenes. And that's a transformation which we call a geminal hydrogenation. It's not a new reaction. I think it's a new mode of reaction. It's a new mode of delivering hydrogen to an unsaturated substrate. And very frankly, after 150 years of catalytic hydrogenation, it's probably the most widely used reaction catalytic reaction in academia and in industry, to find a new mode of delivering hydrogen, I thought is impossible. But I think that's, that's what it is. <coughs> now you may say, OK, that's nice. But what he tells us is funny. It's a funny story. He started with transhydrogenation. Now he shows us this funny geminal hydrogenation. The question is, do these two reactions have anything in common? <laughs> because it could very well be that Transhydrogenation has one pathway, and geminal hydrogenation has another pathway, and they are completely disconnected from each other. And especially, since we can isolate some of these carbenes, you may <coughs> say maybe they are completely irrelevant for catalysis. That's very well possible. And so how can we check that? And our NMR people came up with this beautiful experiment. It's a duty experiment, and in this dimension, you see the FIP-enhanced uh, uh, spectrum. So here you see this AP pattern of our intermediate. And in this dimension, it's an exchange spectrum. So you see that this intermediate talks to the transalkene from the cross peak, and it talks to an alkene isomer. And it talks a little bit to overreduction, which is usually less of a problem. So it, gener it clearly is connected to the catalytic cycle, and both the product formation and byproduct formation. And this was the kind of information that we were feeding into my uh, esteemed colleague uh, Walter Thiel and Walter and his postdocs helped us in parallel and uh, did a lot of very advanced computations, first on the DFT level, and then they did all the stationary points again 
on the couple clusters are the most expensive level of theory that you can go to. And I, rather than going through the details, I just try to summarize what we think is ongoing here. What we think is ongoing is that the metal activates the bonds, as I have shown you, to the degree that first hydrogen atom gets delivered to the bisystem. And if you do so, you generate a metallocyclopropene and then the second part, which can be hydrogen or boron or silicon or germanium, etc., is getting delivered to this carbonic end of your metallocyclopropene, and that goes directly to the trans product according to the computer. We call it our concerted pathway. Don't overinterpret this expression. It's not concerted in the puristic sense, but it's concerted to the degree that there's essentially no barrier. So basically what it means is the catalyst binds the liver, turns around and delivers again. There's essentially no serious barrier in between. So we call it, for the sake of brevity, our concerted pathway. But at least for hydrogenation, at least for, hi uh, <coughs> at least for hydrogenation, and recently it was also shown by, again, a Hong Kong group, also for hydroboration, you can deliver the second element to this end. That gives us the general hydrogenation. That gives the carbene. And then the carbene does what the carbene is supposed to do. It does a one-two hydrogen shift, assisted by hydrogen, but that's a detail. And that is a stepwise process that also gives the trans product. So we have a common intermediate, and then the pathway bifurcates in a concerted and in a stepwise pathway. And both end up at the same kind of product. Now, if you imagine for a second that in this intermediate, this carbene, this substituent also carries hydrogen, you can do the one, two hydrogen shift also in this direction. And that is probably the gateway to the isomers that we have observed. So the culprit for the isomers is the carbene. So if we want to have an isomerization free trans hydrogenation, we probably have to switch off all this lower pathway, which we have not managed to do, very frankly. And if you had asked me a few months ago, is there hope? I would have said, hmm. I'm getting desperate. <laughs> but this is one of the projects of the kind, you know, when the student leaves, who knows that it doesn't work, I assign it to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> hoping that he or she will be creative and maybe find it. So maybe, maybe, maybe we have, quite recently we have a lead, maybe we can uh, still improve on it. But you can also turn the argument around. So this isomerization, sometimes it's almost zero, sometimes it's very significant, and that still limits us uh, significantly. But you can also turn the argument around and say, okay, this is probably a fast process, but if we get super lucky, and maybe we can siphon everything along this pathway, I'll compete this one or switch it off somehow and then harness real carbene chemistry. Okay, that would be nice as well. Which immediately raises the question, which kind of carbine is it? Is it a Fischer carbine or is it a, a Schrock carbine? Well, you can argue either way. Uh, perfectly all right. I, we didn't know it. And then I met my friend and colleague, uh, Christoph Koffere, at the ETH in Zurich. And Christoph said to me, don't tell me. Uh, NMR spectroscopy, solid state NMR spectroscopy will give you the answer. Don't tell me what you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we sent him a sample, this particular one. And what he did is he recorded the solid state NMR spectrum of it. And if you have ever seen a carbine signal in solutions, usually they are not as large as peak, and here it splits something in 19 lines or something like this. So for me, it's a miracle that they can record this spectrum. And then they use the experimental spectrum to calibrate their computations, and that's the computed spectrum. And please remember that NMR is one of the few, if not the only technique, which allows you to probe the N isotropy of your electron distribution about a nucleus. And some of you might remember the Ramsey equation, which correlates orbitals, filled and empty orbitals of certain symmetry with paramagnetic shape. 
And so if you do that, you can deconvolute the spectrum. Well, I cannot deconvolute the spectrum, but Christoph can deconvolute the spectrum, which gives you an idea of the orbitals involved in paramagnetic in the shielding of your signal. You don't get the orbital energies, but what you get is the orbital energy differences, which still, if you do it systematically, gives you an idea, do I have a high-lying homo? Do I have a low-lying homo? Do I have an electron? Do I have a nuclear position? <coughs> so that's what Christoph did, and so I asked him, Christoph, tell me, what is it? <coughs> and he said, well, with a certain flavor of the Spock. <laughs> so let's assume it's a Fischer carbon. So it's an electrophilic carbon. So we probe it chemically. We have learned that an ether substituent will probably steer carbon formation at the distal end. So we expect this kind of carbon to form. If it's electrophilic, why not place a nucleophile, say a carbonyl next to it, which will hit. In this case, forms a five-membered ring, so the kinetics of ring closure is easy, favorable, and it will aromatize, so the driving force is there as well. So if, if, if it's electrophilic, it will cyclize, and that's what we get out. Okay. Now, I was still not fully convinced that we really look at geminal hydrogenation, so I really wanted to know if we go through something like this. And the idea we came up with, oh, here's a bit of scope, okay. Uh, the idea we came up with is the following. Let's replace the cyclohexene ring by an aromatic ring. We probably generate the same intermediate. Now, cyclization is probably much more difficult because the aromatization of the phenyl ring comes along with it. So maybe we can keep it long enough at that stage that we can uh, interrogate our intermediate. And we got very lucky, and again, we could crystallize it out. It's a carbene. It's terminal hydrogenation is real. And I show it because she is very beautiful. Because the carbonyl here that's supposed to attack here sits in the perfect Bergedanis trajectory. So it's just there and wants to bite into, into it. It just doesn't do it because the thermodynamic price that you have to uh, that it had to pay is too high to do that. And then of course you can play around, you can position your nucleophile at different things. Here we upregulate the electrophilicity a bit, but it's the same. We steer carbon formation, let the nucleophile attack, and that's the outcome. This product, nobody needs the product, maybe. <laughs> uh, but please, please, please don't tell me that you would have predicted that is that the outcome of the hydrogenation of this one is that one. Because I do think it's a hydrogenative 2 3 sigma tropic rearrangement, which I think is, has not existed before. It's a new type of transformation. And not only esters migrate, but also carbonates and carbonates and sulfonates and halides even also migrate. So you, you, there is some scope as well. So if it's electrophilic, then it should cyclopropanate. So let's put a, 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 an olefin next to it, and sure enough, it cyclopropanates. Okay. I like it. Again, this compound is completely useless, but I like it because what we learn and teach is that you can cleave a cyclopropane ring by hydrogenolysis. Okay? Here we form the cyclopropene through hydrogenation, which is again against the, all the logic of the conventional textbooks. And then, of course, as an organic chemist, you do what you want to know. Do is you want to know is it stereospecific, so you start putting substituents there to, to learn all this. And if you put substituents there, sure enough, it doesn't cyclopropanate anymore. It switches over to metathesis. With a flavor of the shock <laughs> Isn't it incredible what you can get out of an NMR spectrum? I'm, I'm blown away. And then, of course, you can use... That's another story in itself, why that is so. Uh, but I, post, I don't, don't talk about it, but you can use this pattern. And here's just the first small application, a small marine natural product. Here's the approach. Very cheap. You do a hydrogenation of a heterogeneous catalyst, which is cis delivery, so it gives you this product, racemic though. So I apologize, it's a racemic synthesis. And you do a chelate-controlled alkyne addition. You deprotonate the alkyne, add it to the vinyl of amide, make the substrate, and the substrate now is the substrate for the general hydrogenation reaction. Uh, and true enough, we expect that the carbene will form at the, the distal to the ether. One, two, three, four, five happens away. The five-membered ring should close and the five-membered ring closes 
that that's the outcome of the reaction. So it does work reasonably well, even though that is a pretty crowded environment, as you will see uh, from, from, from that scheme. Final and the almost last application. Um, if today you write a grant proposal, grant application, and you don't write CH functionalization, <laughs> you get it right away <laughs> back without review. <laughs> okay, so well, we also must do some CH functionalization. Uh, how can we do that? It's electrophilic, so we need to upregulate the electrophilicity to the extent it gets so aggressive and somehow starts biting into the CH bonds. <laughs> how can we do that? And again, the idea is simple. We steer carbene formation, and now we conjugate the carbene to one or more double bonds. We know from diines, triines, polyenes that you lower the lumo. And so if we can lower the lumo of our carbene, it will get more electrophilic, and at some point it should do what we would like it to do. And actually one all of the extra olefin suffices. Just this conjugated system, you generate the carbene and bites into the steering substituent, which had led to its formation, and you make this spirocyclic array. Now you may say, okay, that's nice, but funny. Why does it bite into the methyl group, and why doesn't it bite into the secondary, which could be more activated? Okay, uh, actually all we need to do is replace the methyl by another steering substituent, generates the same carbine, has no problem to bite into the secondary. So I think it's just a kinetic preference. It takes the one it can grab first. That's all it takes. So we can take one kind of carbon skeleton and turn it into two very different product <coughs> structures through hydrogenation. And then, of course, this is my favorite one. The enine is commercial. You lithiate, you add into the five-membered lactone, and you quench the alkyl side with methyl iodide. So this is one step to make. And then you hydrogenate and let it bite into it, and you make a spiroacetal. Not by manipulating the spirocenter, but by making a carbon-carbon bond in the periphery through hydrogenated CH functionalization of the action. And I cannot help but show you this application is the same chemistry. Uh, you add your lithiated alkyne into the commercial ketone, quench with methyl iodine, you hydrogenate, get the spirocycle, and then we clip off the side chain by this quantite chemistry, which works very nicely. And I show you this one because this compound is commercially available. You can buy it from the Spirochem, Eric Carreras uh, company. <laughs> and they charge you a fortune. <laughs> Hundred milligrams is close to, I don't know, <laughs> thousand euros or something like this. Only pharma companies, big pharma can afford it. Uh, I can make a kilogram if you want. If you need it, we can make a, we can make a deal. I give you 50% <laughs> We can talk about it. So, and the good thing is hydrogenation. So you can replace hydrogen by deuterium that gives you this isotopolog. You can replace the methyl iodide by deuteromethyl iodide, then you make this isotopolog. And you can do both, and you can make the fully deuterated one as well. And deuteration, uh, isotopolog <coughs> is still very important in the drug discovery. So I think if any reaction that I've shown you might have a commercial potential, then probably it's this, this kind of, of things. So I've shown you what we can do is this. We can generate carbenes through hydrogenation, and we can harness genuine carbene reactivity from them. And I've shown you a couple of examples of what we think are new <coughs> unprecedented, unprecedented reactions. But what I cannot really answer is the much more interesting, bigger picture, the bigger question. Is why is this capital? doing it. Is there any other catalyst that will do the same? We know carbenes from essentially each and every transition metal, from titanium to gold to platinum to rhenium to uh, ruthenium to osmium to uh, you name it, to copper. All of them are very, very well known. Why ruthenium? Why this one? Can we generalize the concept? Well, I wish I knew. If you ask me in a quiet moment, do we have a hope? Mm -hmm. Again, 150 years of catalytic hydrogenation. People have used each and every transition metal salt and complex and what source that you can use, and nobody has ever reported this funny kind of reactivity. So 
the chance that we will discover hundreds of those is not very, very high. So the major mission in the few years that remain in my career is to see if we can find at least a few <laughs> other, other ones. Wherever we can replace, say, diazo decomposition through hydrogenation, that could be an, a nice, nice advance in, in, in terms of organometallic methodology. And of course, we tried all the obvious ones. We have CP star ruthenium, so you can guess which obvious ones we have tried. And uh, I would talk about them if they would have worked. So the, the, the pure screening <coughs> approach was so far not, not very successful, actually. It was unsuccessful. And so again, we have to think about what we are doing. And, and to finish off just very quickly, what, what we think we are doing is the following. We have a catalyst of this kind, CP star, and we need the bulk. If you take this bulk off, you lose the selectivity. So we need the bulk. We need something bulky and relatively electron rich. And then we have, in the cationic system, three vacant coordination <coughs> sites. In the neutral system, we have two vacant coordination sites. And of course, it, it is CP star, so it occupies three coordination sites <coughs> in the facial manner. So the other empty ones are also facial, facial disposed. And so the idea was maybe we can think of other metal fragments which would give us the same kind of array. Block three facial sites and have three facial sites empty. And the idea we came up with is this one. If we can decoordinate the arene, we liberate three facial sites. And we can put in um, electron donating ligand that we can make as bulky as we want. Okay, So maybe that gives us a fragment of this kind. Of course that could change its geometry very quickly, so uh, there's a good chance that it does not work. But in this case we were actually lucky that this system also works. If you do this chemistry and you do the same, you hydrogenate, in this case an ethyne, you generate a carbene, and the carbine now, look at it, it starts looking like a Hoveda type catalyst. <laughs> and if that is a Hoveda type <laughs> catalyst, if that is ruthenium, then it should do metathesis, and that's what it does. And it works with ruthenium, and it works with osmium, that generates a secondary carbine of this structure, which then through a pi-metallic mechanism converts back to the propagating species. So we do have a second system. This second system works for ruthenium and osmium. It's light driven. The light originally I thought we need only for the decoordination of the arene, but it's not true. If we switch the light off, the catalytic cycle dies. If we switch it on again, it re restarts. So somehow it does involve probably some photo excited intermediate. Don't ask me what it is. It's already complicated enough. I have no very clear, <coughs> but it does work. <coughs> now, who needs this product? Nobody. <laughs> okay? But we do generate a secondary carbene. Our secondary carbene from the metathesis is this one. And that starts looking like a Grubbs type or Grubbs variant type of catalyst. So maybe we shouldn't optimize the reaction for the organic product. Maybe we should optimize it for this secondary carbene and do it in a stoichiometric fashion and generate <coughs> secondary carbons through hydrogenation. Can that be done? Well, it can. So all you need to do is take this kind of substrate to the general hydrogenation light driven and you get the secondary carbene, but in a lousy yield. <laughs> so it's proof of concept. It does work. We can generate something which looks like a second generation of a type catalyst. <coughs> But we get a lot of side reactions. In this case, dimerization, we know what the side reactions are through metallocycles, etc. So not very nice, not much more than proof of concept. And why is it so poor? Now, in a classical Hoveda catalyst, you have a hydrogen on the carbon. In this case, because it comes from hydrogenation, we necessarily have a carbon substituent. And this carbon substituent, substituent points upwards because the ether fixes the carbene, and so it must point upwards. It points directly, it clashes directly into the substituent of the n-heterocycling carbene above it. 
and that's probably sterically not very favorable. And you see it from the X-ray structure. So here it is, it clashes, it's less than Van der Waals, and you see what the NHC does. It tilts completely, to give it more space. So the sterics clearly is unfavorable in this case. So what we need to do is relieve it of the steric pressure, which we cannot do because we need a carbon substituent over there. But organometallic chemistry has always a trick. And so the idea was very simple. We turn the car key by 90 degree. And that can be done. Those of you who know the all of the metathesis literature know that if you, in a Coveda catalyst, if you replace the oxygen by a soft donor, like a halide, the carbene turns this. And if we do that, then we should not have any steric problems. So we replace our original substrate by this one, and sure enough, <coughs> we generate the carbene, which is now cis-oriented, and here's the X-ray structure of it. There's absolutely no, no doubt that we do that. And then, of course, if you want to have the, the, the real Hoveda type catalyst do a stoichiometric cross metathesis with the, the styrene of choice that you want to make, and that allows you to make classical Hoveda type second generation <coughs> catalysts through geminal hydrogenation. So, geminal hydrogenation <coughs> is real, and it can be used maybe even to make compounds that could have a certain commercial value. I'm still not very happy with this one. Uh, unhappy because the iodide works better than the bromide, works better than the chloride, and of course the iodide is the most expensive of those. <laughs> so it's still a relatively expensive substrate, uh, but chemistry works and we are still thinking of how we might further improve on this to make it more interesting and more viable. That brings me to the end of what I wanted to tell you here. The funny things about carbines Tinkering with carbene chemistry is a very appropriate title for my presentation. So I started off with uh, what all of us know, of course, the classical regime of cis delivery of dihydrogen or hydroelement bonds to bi systems. I hope I could convince you that we have a growing list, a growing arsenal of reactions which are stereo complementary to the, the cis addition reaction, and that these reactions are. Very reliable, except for the hydrogenation, which still has this isomerization problem, but all the others are very reliable and do work also in the context of pretty complicated target molecules with plenty of functionality that is around. So they are robust and useful. And maybe there is yet another regime, the geminal hydrogenation, which I could show you two examples, and I don't know if there is any other example out there in the literature time will have to show us whether this is the case. I'm not going to finish off without giving credit to the people who did all the work. Uh, this was, uh, I received that on my last presentation just before the pandemic. <laughs> and uh, so I would like to hand over these flowers to the people who did the work in the laboratory. And this is, we have the tradition that before the Christmas party starts, we take a photograph of the group. This is the photograph from the last Christmas party before Corona, and I show you this particular one because it really shows many of the faces who did the chemistry that I was describing for you uh, in my presentation today. I'd also like to thank all the collaboration partners. Without theory, we would be not existent anymore. Same is true with this superb group of people who do high, highest level spectroscopy with us in many different ways. X-ray and then also uh, people who test our compounds for their biological activities. I'm grateful to the organizations uh, which have paid our bills so far and I, I hope they continue to do so for a few more years. And finally and last not least I would like to thank all of you for coming. Again thanks to the committee uh, for selecting me and allowing me to come. It has been a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you very much.